All right, everybody. Uh, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And we're here to study another sutra tonight. Um, we are still in our Majima Nikaya, uh, but we're moving on to a new section. Uh, so tonight we're going to be talking about sutta number 71, the Tavija Vacha Gotra Sutra, uh, the teaching about the threefold knowledge given to this person, Vacha Gotta. Um, well, before we dive into this new sutta tonight, we're moving into a new section, a new group of suttas. So if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, I just want to remind you that the last, oh, however many weeks, you know, five, six, maybe more, uh, we've been doing a group of suttas from this collection that they were all teachings given to uh, bhikshus, to renunciants, to what we would call monastics. We kind of got what we could out of those teachings, us, you know, sort of being householders in that way. But now we're moving on to this new section. And so this is the division of the Paribhajaka, the Paribhajaka Vaga, so the division on the wanderers. And I actually want to talk for just a quick moment about that word Paribhajaka. So this sutra is the actually the first in three suttas that we're going to talk about. Uh, not tonight, but what it is, is, is that this is a little uh, mini group of three teachings, each given to this uh, wanderer, uh, Vachagutta. And, you know, it no surprise, a lot of these sutras that we've been reading, they're kind of um, conversion stories, right? It's like people hearing the Dharma, and then kind of coming over to Buddhism. Well, this is the kind of conversion story of Vachagutta, but it doesn't happen right away. It happens at the end of the third teaching. So in three weeks, we'll talk about that one. Tonight, we're just going to talk about the first one. Um, by the way, before I forget to mention it, if you're familiar with the connected discourses, right, the Samyutta Nikaya, we kind of went through some of the suttas in this a long time ago, but there's a section number 33. It's all actually a bunch of little suttas all also around this person, Vachagutta. So it, the Buddha seems to have had a kind of relationship with this Vachagutta guy, and then eventually brought him over to the world of Buddhism. So if you want to know more about him, you can read more, but we're going to read these three over the next three weeks. But first, let's talk about the, the wanderers. So this word, pari, so P-A-R-I, and then B, B, long A, J, short A, K short A. So Pariba Jaka. And what we want to know just really quickly, because this is kind of like it's a, a little interesting. The word, the root of this word is Vraj. And it means to walk. But it's a particular kind of walking, which is it's a pari a pari walking. And that prefix in Sanskrit and the Pali language, P-A-R-I, pari. We hear it a lot. We hear it in words like pari nirvana, um, a bunch of these words. And interestingly, there's an English prefix that is related to this word or this prefix in Sanskrit. And a good way to remember this is that it's the word perimeter. So the pari meter, <laughs> right? The, the measurement of the pari. 
And so what we need to know is that the perimeter, so this is a kind of a good mnemonic device, the perimeter is the, is the outermost limit, right? That's like the perimeter. And putty, putty means like at the edge, at the limit in that way. And that's where you get the idea of like, not just nirvana, but pari nirvana, this kind of like ultimate nirvana, because it's at the very limit of nirvana. I say this because this idea of a pari pajaka is literally sort of what the, what the word literally means, is somebody that walks around the edge. But there's an English word that's kind of, it's popular nowadays, so I thought it would be interesting to kind of relate it to this. But in English nowadays, we talk a lot about the outliers. Now, the idea of an outlier, of course, is more of like a kind of a sociological term in that way. But so is this idea of a paribijaka, because, yeah, they're wanderers, <laughs> meaning, you know, they're homeless in that way. They don't live anywhere. But it's also a it's a social designation to be sort of at the at the edges of society. And I think we even use that expression in English as well, to be at the edges of society. I'm saying all of this because a lot of what I want to try to do with Dharma doors is like, you know, create the context in which these teachings were given, right? And I want us to kind of understand that the Buddha was one among many wanderers. And the Buddha got a good following, but there were other groups. We've heard about the Nigranthas or the Jains, who actually they're going to pop up quickly in this sutta. So I just kind of want us to kind of like recognize that this was a world of religious seekers out in the perimeters of society. And so the Buddha is basically about to have an exchange with one of these paribijakas or one of these wanderers. And well, we'll get into the sutta, but I just kind of want us to know that that's the context of the, the whole group of suttas is discourses with other wanderers in that way. So um, again, this sutta that we're reading, number 71, is called the Tevidya. If you know your Sanskrit, that's the Trividya, the three knowledges, which that's the topic. So we're going to talk a lot about it tonight. But it's the Tevidya Vachagutta Sutra. <laughs> Right, so the three knowledges as told to Vachagutta. So let's just find out a little bit about like the background of where this is taking place and all. So thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Vasali or Vaishali in Sanskrit in the great wood in the hall with the peaked roof. Now, on that occasion, the wanderer, the Paribijaka Vachagutta, was staying in the wanderer's park of the single white lotus mango tree. Then, when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe went into Vaisali for alms. But then the Blessed One thought, it's still too early to wander for alms in Vaisali. Suppose I went to the wanderer Vachagutta in the wanderer's park of the single white lotus mango tree. Then the Blessed One went to the wanderer Vachagutta in the wanderer's park of the single white lotus mango tree. The wanderer Vachagutta saw the Blessed One coming in the distance and said to him, Let the Blessed One come. Venerable sir, welcome to the Blessed One. It is long since the Blessed One found an opportunity to come here. Let the Blessed One be seated. This seat is ready. The Blessed One sat down on the seat made ready. 
and the wanderer Vachagutta took a low seat, sat down to one side, and said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, I've heard this. The recluse Gotama claims to be omniscient and all-seeing, to have complete knowledge and vision thus. Whether I am walking or standing or sleeping or awake, knowledge and vision are continuously and uninterruptedly present to me. Venerable Sir, do those who speak that way say what has been said by the Blessed One and not misrepresent him with what is contrary to fact? Do they explain in accordance with the Dharma in such a way that nothing, in such a way that nothing which provides a ground for censure can be legitimately deduced from their assertion? Let's pause there to wait for the Buddha's answer. But now we kind of have the context and we have the question. So the first thing I want to point out is if you read the Vachagutta section of the Samyutta Nikaya, you'll quickly realize that the Buddha is always engaging in, uh, I guess we could call it metaphysical speculation. So all of the Buddha's conversations with Vachagutta, they're about things like where the world came from, uh, what, what, what constitutes the end of the world, um, different, again, different kind of metaphysical ideas. And the topic tonight, this is what we're going to kind of talk all night about. The topic tonight is omniscience this idea of what could be called or what is called sarvanya or sarvanyanya, sarvanya, all knowledge. Now, this is a topic that we've talked about mm, kind of one other time recently. And what it was is, is that there was a sutta a, a long time ago. I think it was, which sutta was that? I forget what it was. It was in the 30s, I think. Maybe I wrote it down. Did I write it down? Yeah. Oh, Sutta number 58. So actually not too long ago. And at the very end of that one, and that was the Sutta where the Buddha talked with Prince Abhaya. And Prince Abhaya had a question about the Buddha's knowledge. And basically he asked the Buddha, like, do you like know everything already? Or like when people ask you a question, the answer comes to you. And the Buddha basically said, yeah, like when they ask me the question, it comes to me. We're going to have a reason to kind of revisit that sutta in a moment. But I just want you to know that it was these kinds of conversations with the Buddha that eventually win over Vachagutta in that way. So we want to kind of pay attention to this kind of metaphysical conversation here. The one thing, because it's going to come up later on tonight, to my knowledge and my recollection, this is one of the first suttas that takes place in, that we've read in a long time, that takes place in Vasali, or again, in, in Sanskrit, it's Vaishali. And Vaishali is a very interesting location. Um, oh, I have my map. So here's our little map of India at the time of the Buddha. And you know, Sh Shravasti or Savati is where we're usually at. And I want us to notice that Vaishali is down here near Rajgriha. And this is sort of like the, you know, this is where the Bodhi tree is. It's kind of like the epicenter of Buddhism. But Vaishali is interesting, and it actually has a little bit to do with the hall with the peaked roof. So the reason why I'm mentioning this now is because Vaishali is like, well, it's kind of famous for a lot of things, but it's most famous, perhaps, 
for being the location of the second council. I'm not sure if you're familiar with your Buddhist history, but shortly after the Buddha died, there was the first council, like the great council of all the arhats. And that's where they got together to decide what the teachings were, what the rules were, and all of that. But then a little while later, I think within a hundred years, maybe less, I'm not sure about this, but at a certain point, there started to develop divisions within the Sangha. And so there was a second council called in Vaishali to like straighten things out. And this was the beginning of the schisms in the world of Buddhism that would eventually result in like the major split between Mahayana and Theravada, right? And then even more splitting within those major factions. We're going to return to that sort of towards the end of the sutta, but I wanted to remind everybody about that. There's one other very famous sutra, but it's a Mahayana sutra that takes place in Vaishali, and that's the Vimalakirti sutra. And I'm going to talk about Vimalakirti at the end of tonight because of its interesting relationship with this, or at least with the topic of the sutta. So I tried to find out about the single white lotus mango tree, but alas, I couldn't find any information on this uh, uh, very enticing sounding place. Uh, but that's the park of the wanderers where the Buddha goes. Um, yeah, so that sort of gets us through the beginning, the where, the who, and all of that. And now we get to the question. So the paripricha, as it might be called, the question, is about the Buddha's sarvanya, or the Buddha's omniscience and all-seeing. And what Vachagutta says is, I've, I've heard this about you. I've heard this about you, Buddha. Is this true? Is it true that you are omniscient and all-seeing, have complete knowledge and vision? And is it true that you have said that whether walking, standing, sleeping, or awake, knowledge and vision are continuously and uninterruptedly present in me or present to me? And then Vachagota asks, so if, if I said that about you, would I be right? <laughs> like, would that be in accordance with the Dharma? And what we kind of need to know is, is and we've heard this before, I mean, we've heard this exact language before. And what it is, is, is that this was way back, way back in Sutta number 14, where the Buddha had a kind of a run-in with the Nigrantas. And if you remember, the Nigrantas are, nowadays we refer to them as the Jains or the Jains. So Mahavira, the leader of the Nigrantas, the leader of the Nigrantas claimed to be omniscient, or at least within the Buddhist representation of the Nigrantha teachings. We should always be aware of this, right? But in the Buddhist representation of the Nigrantha teachings, Mahavira, the head of the Nigrantas, was omniscient, all-seeing, but claimed that that omniscience was constantly present in front of him, whether he was walking, standing, sleeping, or, um, you know, uh, whether he was standing, sleeping, or awake, or walking. So Vach Vachagutta says, is this true of you? The Buddha says, Vachaha. Those who say that, those who say thus, they do not say what has been said by me but they misre misrepresent me with what is untrue and contrary to fact. Bhachagutta says, Venerable sir, how should I answer that I may say that what has been said by the Blessed One 
and not misrepresent him with what is contrary to fact. How can I explain in accordance with the Dharma in such a way that nothing which provides a ground for censure can be legitimately deduced from my assertion? Vachaha, the Buddha said, if you answer this way, the recluse Gotama has the threefold true knowledge. Then you will be saying what has been said by me, and you will not misrepresent me with what is contrary to fact. You will explain in accordance with the Dharma in such a way that nothing which, is, which provides a ground for censure can be legitimately deduced from your assertion. And in case we forgot from our earlier suttas, what are the threefold knowledge? Well, number one, for Bhachagutta, insofar as I wish, I recollect my manifold past lives. That is, one birth, two births, and let's see if we can't find, let's see, are you? Yeah, let's read it in its entirety. So the Buddha says, for insofar as I wish, I recollect my manifold past lives. That is one birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, 10 births, 20 births, 30 births, 40 births, 50 births, 100 births, 1,000 births, 100,000 births. Many kalpas of world contraction. Many kalpas of world expansion. Many kalpas of world contraction and expansion. There, I was named such and such, of such and such a clan, with such and such an appearance, with such and such and such as my nutriment. Such was my experience of pleasure and pain. Such was my lifespan. And passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere. And there, too, I was named such and such of such and such a clan, with such and such an appearance, and such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my lifespan. And passing away from there, I reappeared here. Thus, with their aspects and their particulars, I recollect my manifold past lives. Should we do these all three at once or one at a time? Should we talk? <laughs> all right, let's get all through. We'll go through all three of these and then we'll talk about all three. So that's the first of the threefold knowledge, recollecting past lives. Number two, and insofar as I wish, the Buddha says, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human eye, I see beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. And I understand how beings pass on according to their karma. Let's see. Where did you go? Hold on, I should have better bookmarks. Oop. There you are. So with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I see beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. I understand how beings pass on according to their karmic actions. And I understand it this way. 
these were the beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind, revilers of the noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong views in their actions. Upon the dissolution of the body after death, they have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, even in hell. But these worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech, and mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions upon the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a good destination, even in a heavenly world. So that's the second. So again, the Buddha, thus with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I see beings passing away and reappearing. And then the third. And, the Buddha says, by realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I here and now entered upon and abide in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. So if you answer that way, the recluse Gotama has the threefold true knowledge. You will be saying what has been said by me and will not misrepresent me with what is contrary to fact. You will explain in accordance with the Dharma in such a way that nothing which provides a ground for censure can be legitimately deduced from your assertion. All right, so we have encountered this teaching before, or we've certainly encountered, you know, these things, but we've also just in encountered this teaching before. But let's go through it because I think it's always kind of I think it's always an important, interesting conversation to have the one about, well, the one about past lives stuff is important, actually. But even this whole conversation about like the superpowers, as they are called, or these like super knowledges, like I think it's important to talk about these from a, from a dharmic point of view. So... Let's start with the first one and let's just tackle some of the kind of more important things about it. So, you know, the this idea that a enlightened being or an awakened being has this recollection of their past lives. I've said this before, but, you know, this is not unique to Buddhism at all. In fact, this is kind of a very interesting commonality between a lot of traditions. Even Scientology, actually, has an aspect of becoming aware of your past lives as a, you know, as a sign of spiritual maturation. So it's kind of everywhere, this one. And, and I know that within the world of Buddhism, this one's kind of tricky because we have this understanding that the Buddha teaches anatta or anatman, the no self teaching. And so there's this no self reincarnation. How does that work? And so that's why I think that this is an important like thing to talk about because there is a lot of talk of reincarnation in Buddhism and it's a big part of it. And if we are strictly sticking with the early teachings, if we're strictly sticking with the Pali Canon, then the entire point of this is to end the rebirthing process. My point, though, is, is that the idea of putting an end to the cyclical process of birth, death, and rebirth implies that there is such a thing as the cyclical process of birth and death. But it needs to in a way come to an end so let's kind of talk about this like how this kind of works in that way really quickly because and we do have these two other super knowledges to talk about but i just want to remind everybody that this is actually not as um 
you know, it's not as doctrinally difficult to understand in that way. And what it is, and I think most of you have heard this from me before, but again, never hurts to hear it again. This idea, this teaching about, about like the idea of no self. And actually let's just sort of like uh, put it to you this way, or let's remind us. The idea that there's just not that me that I think there is, the teaching is about how it just isn't. It just isn't the case, actually. It's a, it's a giant misunderstanding. <laughs> the point is, is that there isn't a self that needs to be put away. There's not a self that needs to be dismantled. There's not a self that needs to, there's just no self. <laughs> but there's the, this persistent delusion of a self. There is that. And what I'm getting around to is that if we understand that it is just the case that there is no self, but we do have a sense of ourselves from last week or a month ago or a year ago. And so what I always kind of like to do is, is I, I like to begin by taking this outside of the conversation of reincarnation. And I like to just think of it in terms of <laughs> that you think it was you last year, last, you know, Thanksgiving or last Christmas or whatever. There's the idea that that was you that or that it was me. And then as we often go through this with Dharma doors, and I think it was me two years ago. And I think it was me 10 years ago. And I think it was me 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way back to the day I was born. And now what we often do, or what I often like to do, is I often like to take that idea of the me that was born and the me that I say or claim is here now, are these the same thing? <laughs> that meaning the baby that was born 50 years ago and this being that is before you now, they're the same being? Despite all the physical differences and the mental differences and the emotional differences, despite all of that, there's the idea that there's me. The me from before, the me that's happening, and then I'll see you next week. And then that'll be me. This is all the idea of me. The one me. And what I'm kind of trying to show you is that we can have this idea of a self that goes back a year or two or 10 or 20 or 30. And there can be the attachment to that as self, just like I can get attached to my sweater as self. I can get attached to my stuff as self. I can get attached to all kinds of things as self. I can also get attached to that year ago body. And I have this idea that it was me. So what I'm trying to kind of point at is how that those two things can kind of exist simultaneously. The truth of no self and the persistent delusion of self. <laughs> they, they coexist all the time in that way. In other words, if I can just insert this really quickly here, ending the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth is about waking up. There's no work to be done. There's a realization to be had, and that ends the cycle right then and there. 
But before that, or actually on, on the road to that, a quick little note. In the traditional world of Buddhism, like the traditional kind of narrative of Buddhism, you, you might have heard the, the famous story of Siddhartha sitting under the Bodhi tree, defeating Mara. And then in this famous part of the story, after the Buddha defeats Mara, the evil one, he then stays under the Bodhi tree and then through the three watches of the night. So these are these two hour blocks and during the watches of the night, during the first watch of the night, the Buddha attained the first of these knowledges, which is that he remembered all past lives. Then during the second watch of the night, the Buddha developed the divine eye, which we'll talk about next. And then finally at that third watch of the night as the as the morning star or Venus just appeared on the horizon, the Buddha attained the third of these knowledges, the knowledge of the destruction of the taints. And then that constituted this kind of full awakening. Vachagutta is asking specifically about the omniscience of the Buddha in this enlightened state. The question, again, really quickly, is the question about, are you like Mahavira, the leader of the Nigrantas, do you claim that your knowledge is, that this sarvanya, that this all knowledge, do you claim that it's present all the time? And we want to notice the language that the Buddha uses in describing the knowledge of the past lives, which he says, insofar as I wish... I recollect my manifold past lives. By the way, there's lots of footnotes by uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi and Bhikkhu Nyanamoli about this in the back. But basically, the, what it is, is, is that the Buddha does not claim to have all knowledge all the time. It's more of, and again, if you go back to that Abhaya Sutta that we read, it's more of a directed knowledge where the answer to any question or any form of knowledge can come to the Buddha, but it's just not sort of there all the time, all right? So this is the first of these, these recollection of past lives. I want to say one more thing about remembering past lives. I haven't, I might not have said this recently. I think this is kind of the most interesting thing about recollection of past lives. So my kind of both my understanding of it and to a certain degree, my experience of it, limited as it might be, my understanding of this is that there is, as I just was mentioning, we can have a very kind of attached understanding of the self. And what I mean by that is, is that there can be an understanding of the self that is totally identified with the skandahas, totally identified with this body of form. And and actually, like, it could get even, you know, to the point where, you know, you, you know, you might have noticed, I sometimes have a beard, sometimes I don't have a beard, sometimes the beard gets really crazy. But it could be that I was so attached to my physical form, that I always had to have a beard, because I have a beard. My point is, is that the mind can become rigidly attached to this body. And my understanding is, is that that type of myopia, a kind of like fixed view of self as this body, it actually that identifying becomes like a giant 
blinder or a giant blockage to knowledge of previous lives. But if you start spending a little bit of time not identifying with that specific physical body, by which I mean meditative states in which you are not really clinging and identifying with anything in that way. The idea is, is that the more a mind becomes more comfortable in these meditative states where they're not, the mind is not clinging to the body, that mind, without the blockage of this specific self-ego, now can become aware of the previous life. Because the identity of self is no longer bound up with this particular body. And basically, you can remember, oh, I haven't always been this body. But if you never get that perspective, in a way, you'll, you'll be cut off from such knowledge. Now, the idea is, is that if you kind of, you know, start meditating, having that kind of, um, let's call it a transcendent experience, transcendent of the body in some way. If you start doing that, you might become aware of last lifetime. Oh, by the way, I haven't probably maybe ever said this, but even before knowledge of your previous immediate past life, my personal experience has also been that this type of, um, um, you know, the Buddhists like this term malleability, but this idea of a, of a malleable mind, it doesn't just open you up to like past life memories. It actually opens you up to memories of just your, like years ago. <laughs> Meaning for many of us, even last week is a little foggy, let alone a year ago, two years ago, 10 years ago. Like, But this same opening of the mind, this same malleability of the mind, it opens up memories of this life. And then the previous life. And then as the Buddha says, one birth, two births, hundred births, thousand births, a hundred thousand births. And not only that, you know what your name was, what you ate, what made you happy, what made you sad, where you lived, who your family was. And the Buddha attained a state of all knowledge of all past lives, including if you've read your Jataka tales, even before he was human, memories of being an animal, memories of being bugs. Like, because if you know, that's how it goes. The, the, the grass that's like really good grass dies and becomes flowers. <laughs> and the flowers that are really great die and become big giant trees. And those big giant trees die and become little bugs. And those little bugs die and become more complex animals. And it's a giant cycling up of consciousness until you get to the point of being a human or even a god. So that's a bunch of ideas about reincarnation. Questions, comments, answers, or ideas before we move on to the second of the three knowledges. Again, I know we've discussed a lot of that before. This is for tonight. Oh, yeah, Maria. I just want to put it into context of this idea of omniscience tonight. But what you got, Maria? Well, I've been thinking about <clears throat> a comment you made a while back. We were talking about no self. And you said, I think I may have made a mistake or something like this in saying that there there is no self. It doesn't actually say in the teachings that there's no self there's a delusion of a self and 
I just keep thinking about that. And so tonight I'm thinking about these examples that tell me if I'm on the right track about thinking about this. It's not as if there isn't a self in the same way that when we talk about a car or the idea of a car, right? There's, it's not as if there isn't something in practical terms of form that we, you know, drive down the street. So in the same way, is it that it's not as if there's not some Maria here that I'm driving down the street, you know, that operates in practical terms. I just got mixed up about exactly what it is and its permanence and all that. Um, and then there's this idea of like, a tree and I'm a little bit, so there's this sort of embodiment of the life force, there's being, and then there's this idea of tree and there's not really any trees, um, but there is this form, right? That's appearing. Um, so are any of those examples sort of better examples of ways to think about the self than there's just no self or, you know, whatever. So. Excellent. Excellent question, Maria. In fact, one of the Samyutta Nikayas, the collection with Vachagota, it's actually exactly that very idea about the idea of a self and whether the Buddha says there is a self or isn't a self. And the Buddha basically refuses to say whether there is a self or is not a self for the reasons that I'm about to get into. So your, your thinking is right on Maria, as far as if I ever said there's no self, I was wrong. That's a bad way of putting it. Let me be much more accurate. The teaching is about avoiding the extreme views. And I want to remind you that there's a lot of different ways to understand the extreme views. It's, it's any extremity in terms of true or false, right or wrong. But a really important one is the extreme view of existent or not existent? Does the self exist or does it not exist? And the Buddha says, what I teach is called the Madhyamika, right? This middle path between the extreme views. So does the self exist? No. Does the self not exist? No. So we are there because, or what, where we're at is that we, this is the big problem, by the way, we think the self exists and, and we think the self will not exist. And now there's fear, anxiety, stress from the complex idea of I exist now, but won't exist. And the reason why the Buddhist teachings are called the teachings of Amrita, of the deathless, is because the Buddha is saying that if you understand that you don't exist, you will have no fear of not existing. But it's a great misunderstanding of thinking that I currently am. I currently exist. And that means there was a time I didn't exist. And now I exist, but there will be a time when I don't exist. Or there's a radical alternative way to understand what's going on here. And that brings us to what you were getting at, Maria, or kind of what you kept mentioning, which is that there is this. And that's where we get to, in the Mahayana, we get to this beautiful idea of suchness. 
that the tree, as you were just saying, Maria, that the tree doesn't exist, but it doesn't not exist. Otherwise, what are we talking about? So there is the suchness of a tree. And when you understand suchness, you understand why tree, <laughs> right? And that's a lot like all of these things. To understand up is to understand down. <laughs> now, is there up? Relative to me, there's up, but the astronauts say it's down. So is there up, is there down? Not really, not really existently, but look, <laughs> behold, up. So that's where we kind of avoid the extreme views of existent, non-existent. Yeah. By the way, Maria, this great question of yours is what next week's sutra is totally about. So you're actually like anticipating where this is going. So, all right. Shall we move on to the second of these knowledges? So the second one, the Divya Chakshas. Divya, the divine, the Deva I. This is the divine I or the heavenly I. And, you know, as it's described here, this is about the divine eye, which surpasses the human eye, and can see beings passing away here and reappearing there. And whether they are, you know, beautiful or ugly or whatever, whatever. So this specific aspect of the divine eye is, you know, as, as I've read about it in more detail, it's basically the the divine eye is a being's ability to read another being's karma and to basically know where they will be reborn as a result of their karma. You know, you can think about it kind of more cartoonishly as far as like, like knowing somebody will be reborn as an animal because of their behavior in this life. But it's much more nuanced than that in terms of knowing exactly where somebody's going to be reborn because of their karmic trajectory. And that's basically what's going on here is that a Buddha is described as being able to see trajectories, like these kind of like kind of deterministic outcomes in that way. Now, the thing about it is that both of the, actually, and I want to talk about this all together really quickly, because I might miss the chance and forget. And this is what I really wanted to mention tonight. So the original question was about omniscience, right? But the specific question was about, like, is it right in front of you all the time? And the Buddha says, no. But what I want us to notice, and, and I know that I didn't really ever pick up on this till recently, but if you look at it, what you kind of realize is that the first of the knowledges is about the past. The second of these knowledges is about the future. And as the language says, and the third of these is realizing here and now the destruction of the taints. So it's about the present. So notice that all three time periods are accounted for. And I kind of want to highlight that as an aspect of the omniscience. So there is this kind of total knowledge of the past, of the future, of the present, but it's not all at once. It's, again, this directed knowledge in that way. So... All right. Um, any questions about the so-called divine eye and what's going on with that? <laughs> um, really quickly, just because I, I, I'll say one thing about it, if you haven't heard this, which I think everybody has heard this from me before, 
but the way that I understand the divine eye, the way that I think about the divine eye, I always use this analogy. Again, you've heard it before, but it's the analogy of someone who can track animal prints. And it's that difference between somebody who is not trained in tracking animal tracks. They, somebody who's not trained in it, if they go out to the woods and they see it like a animal's footprint in the mud, and then there's somebody else who's like a trained animal tracker, they're looking at the same footprint, but the track or the person who's not trained, all they can see is like the muddy footprint. But the person who is trained can see like, you know, they can kind of reverse engineer the actual animal and can, you know, because of how deep it is, they can tell how heavy it was because of the slide. They can tell what direction it was running. They can tell how fast it was running. There's a way in which the tracker can see time, can see the past, can see the future, can see what is not there to be seen, right? Well, my understanding of the divine eye is that it's kind of like that. I, I call it, you know, a Dharma tracker, right? Where they're observing the same dharmas as the rest of us, but with that kind of wisdom or knowledge of a trained tracker who can see more than is there to be seen in that way. So that's a way to think about the divine eye. And then the third of these. And the third of these is realizing for oneself with direct knowledge deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. So this is the ashrava. The ashrava are the those outflows or the taints. And this is that extinguishing of the taints. We've heard a lot about the taints for a while now. This is basically... Well, this is actually an idea that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. And it was this idea that it's it's like one thing to have uh it's one thing to have a craving for something. Let's say an unhealthy craving for something. That's normal. That's what we're that's what we're here talking about, right? Now the idea is is that that unhealthy craving isn't happening all the time. <laughs> it can be triggered, of course, by different things where we're like, oh, I could really use my whatever it is, right? Now, if you begin cultivating and begin practicing, you might be able to, in a way, notice the diminishing of the needy, wanty, desiring for that thing. And then there's a way in which it might have been years, years since you participated in that type of pleasure, but something happens years later and it kind of triggers something and whatever, you participate in that pleasure. But what Buddhism is talking about is a state in which the individual is aware that that is gone, that it's gone and it's not coming back. <laughs> and so what I'm getting at is, is that yes, the destruction of the taints is what we're going for, but this is particularly, the, the particular superpower here is not destroying the taints it's knowledge that they have been destroyed and that's what i'm getting at is that it's this really like serious level of knowledge where you know oh i've i've beaten that hang up or that desire or whatever some don't really think that that is possible 
Like there is a kind of modern theory of psychology that basically says, no, like such eradication of things is not possible. That That's certainly a view <laughs> that it's not possible, but I'm kind of here to mention that it's a very much a part of Buddhism that it is possible. In many ways, if it weren't possible, we really wouldn't be here. Yeah, Noe. Well, he also clarifies it in the here and now. There it mm. is. Yep. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. I, the, it, it, it's that presence of, of presence, so to speak. Yep. The here and now. And my thinking wants it in the past and sometimes comes up again, even in my language. <laughs> I worry, oh, did I get it? Am I getting it? What? What? So it's that idea. But wait, this is why for me the breath is so important. Why stillness is so important. Why practice is so important to just, man, and then it's over. Mm -hmm. and, and onward we go, as they say. But I appreciate that the here and now enter upon and abide in the deliverance of the taints. Thanks, Noe. All right. So that's our review of the three knowledges. <clears throat> Again, this is what constitutes sort of the omniscience of a Buddha or the omniscience of, you know, um, what omniscience means in Buddhism. But there's a little more, though. So um, I already read uh, the paragraph 10 where the Buddha says, so if you say that about me, that's correct. That is in accord with the Dharma. So when this was said, the wanderer Vachagotta asked the Blessed One, Master Gotama, is there any householder who, without abandoning the fetter of householdership on the dissolution of the body, has made an end of suffering? The Buddha says, Vachaha, there is no householder who, without abandoning the fetter of householdership on the dissolution of the body, has made an end of suffering. Master Gotama, is there any householder who, without abandoning the fetter of householdership upon the dissolution of the body, has gone to heaven? The Buddha said, Vachaha, there are not only 100 or two or three, or four, or five hundred, but far more householders who, without abandoning the fetter of householdership upon the dissolution of the body, have gone to heaven. Master Gautama, is there any Ajivika who on the dissolution of the body has made an end of suffering? Vacha, there is no Ajivika who on the dissolution of the body has made an end of suffering. Master Gotama, is there any Ajivaka who on the dissolution of the body has gone to heaven? And the Buddha says, when I use that superpower of mine and recollect the past 91 kalpas, vachaha, I do not recall any Ajivaka who on the dissolution of the body went to heaven with one exception. And that person held the doctrine of the moral efficacy of action, the doctrine of the moral efficacy of deeds. And then just to finish this up, and then we'll talk. Uh, Bacha says, well, that being the case, Master Gotama, that sectarian fold, meaning the Ajivakas, they're empty, even of those who go to heaven. And that being so, Vachaha, that sectarian fold is empty, even of one who goes to heaven. All right, so that's what the Blessed One said. The wanderer Vachagutta was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words, but didn't fully convert yet. But let's back up, because I want to talk about that last part, about the, the, the gahapati, the, the householder. And that, so a, a gaha is a, 
is a house. A gahapati is a householder. And then this is the, they're talking about gihe samyojana. Gihi samyojana is the samyojana, the fetter of a house, basically. So the question basically is, Master Gotama, um, has there ever been a householder who's ended suffering entirely? So become an arahat, right? Entered nirvana. And the Buddha says, no, there's no householder, or at least there isn't anybody who, without abandoning the fetter of householdership, that they've made an end of suffering. But then apart, the question regarding, is there somebody with the fetter of householdership who after they died went to heaven? And the Buddha says, oh, hundreds, many hundreds, right? So let's talk about that. And then we'll talk about the Ajivikas in a moment. But this kind of sutra or this particular sutra actually is it's sometimes, um, it's kind of sometimes held up as proof that you can't end suffering as a householder. Like that's, that's what it seems to say in that way. And this is where I want to bring back up the Vimalakirti Sutra. So, you know, I used to teach, or I taught at SFDC, I taught the Malakirti Sutra a long time ago. I teach it a lot. It's kind of, you know, it's one of the great Mahayana Sutras. And in doing, you know, a lot of research for those classes, that famous Mahayana Sutra, the Vimalakirti Sutra, it's very much a discourse about householding and not householding. Like, it's very much about that. But of course, it has a, a Mahayana understanding of that. And that's all, you know, beautifully represented in that sutra by Vimalakirti, who is a Gahapati. He is a householder. But of course, the beautiful thing that happens in that sutra is that at the very beginning, he makes his house empty not invisible, not, you know, camouflage, but empty. And, you know, it's a whole, the whole beginning of that sutra is a very funny thing where, you know, all these uh, monks and bodhisattvas come to the Malakirti's empty house and they don't know where to sit, <laughs> right? And it's all these funny questions that are, you know, it's all double entendres in that way. But what that sutra is kind of ultimately about, if you kind of peel back, peel back all the magical layers, it's a discourse about how one can live in a house, but not be attached to the house. And that is the Mahayana attitude towards the whole householder, monastic or renunciant distinction it talks about how there's renunciants who's, who are more attached to the house than some householders. And so it's this idea that it's, it's ultimately a kind of a mentality, not a actual roof over your head in that way. So that's what the Vimalakirti Sutra is ultimately about. But what's interesting is, is that almost every time I run across a sutta or sutra, that takes place in Vaishali, it almost invariably there's a discourse going on around householders versus renunciants. And it makes you kind of wonder if there wasn't an actual kind of, um, you know, that the Vaishalis, the, uh, what were they called? The Lichavis? Yeah, the Lichavis are the people that live in Vaishali. They seem to have had a slightly different attitude about householder renunciation in that way. So the only thing that I want to point out, like from a kind of Dharma teacher, translator, interpreter point of view, if you look at the you know language very carefully, it's about not abandoning the fetter of householdership. 
that's not exactly saying the leaving the house. It's talking about leaving the fetters of the house in that way, which again, you could interpret Vimalakirti as saying the exact same thing. So anybody who holds this up as like proof that householders can't become uh, arhats or end suffering, I wouldn't read it that way. So now what it does want to say explicitly, though, is that definitely householders can cultivate punya, cultivate merit, and can definitely improve their rebirth experience. Like that goes without saying. So questions about householding, not householding. Cool. So then let's just talk about that last group. So the Ajivakas. So the Ajivakas are another of these wandering groups. So they're a lot like the Jains or the Nigrantas, a lot like the Buddhists in that way. They were another group. But like all of these groups, like the Nigrantas, the Ajivakas, they have a, a um, well, they have a drishti. They have a view. They have a, a teaching. They have a doctrine. And basically, um, you know, I, I'm not an expert on ancient, you know, um, sex like this, but the basic things that you hear about the Ajivakas is that they were basically like um, fatalists. And what that meant was, is that like, there's nothing that you can do to change your karmic outcome. That like, let me go back to my cartoonish example before I use the cartoonish example of the Buddha sort of knowing if you would be reborn as an animal or not. Well, in the Ajivaka group, your fate of being reborn as an animal has already been decided. And not only that, basically, but every single action that you will take has already been determined from past actions. So like the, the classic example is like basically just running around doing bad things. And the idea is, is that like, if you choose to do that, you were fated to do that anyways. So you didn't choose to do bad. You also don't choose to do good. It's already in the cards in that way. So what that means is, is that the Ajivakas basically, apparently, felt that there was no reason to do good or avoid doing bad because it was already determined. So now... Vachagutta wants to know, so those people who they think it's all just predetermined in that way, has have any of them ever ended their suffering? And the Buddha says, no, no. And then the question about, well, have any of them gone to heaven? And the Buddha says, there was this one Ajivaka, right? that in the there was only one in the past 91 kalpas right and that's like an eon right an, a, a large amount of time now what's funny about this is that if you if you read the footnote about this that one ajivaka was a prior life of the buddha he was the one ajivaka who did believe in the moral efficacy of action he did believe in the doctrine of the moral efficacy of deeds. So if you remember that from the sutra, it said that the Buddha said, that, well, there was this one Ajivaka and unlike Ajivakas, he believed in the efficacy of action. And because he believed in the efficacy of action, he was reborn again and reborn again and eventually became the Buddha. So, um, yeah, that's a funny, um, that's a whole little trope. Um, I want to mention this really quickly because I have time. This little, again, I'll call it a trope. 
And the trope is, uh, it, it happens in sutras, and it's where the Buddha tells a past story about somebody. And then at the end of the story, he basically goes, and guess what? That person was me. <laughs> and so this is a thing. But then this trope, it becomes a kind of a major part of Mahayana sutras where the Buddha will tell a vast, long story that happened, you know, kalpas and kalpas and kalpas ago. And the story will involve multiple people. And then the whole story will play out. They're always like a, a kind of an allegory where there's a moral story to it. And then in these like more wild Mahayana sutras, the Buddha then says, and, and guess what? That person, that was you. And that person, that was that person. And that person was me. And it's a whole weird, like, um, you know, it's, it, it's, um, that kind of everything everywhere all at once kind of a thing where we've all already been doing this together for lifetimes and lifetimes and this is just the latest version where we're all on zoom together right so this is this becomes a thing and i just want you to know if you study your mahayana sutras and you've noticed this whole like uh backstory and this was you and that was me i want you to know that it comes from these. It comes from the early stuff. It just gets kind of spun a little further out in that way. All right. Any questions about the Ajivikas, about householding, about the three knowledges, anything like that? Just questions in general. Since we have a moment, I want to make a um, not not quite a retraction, uh, kind of a correction, if you will. Uh, this is a correction from last week's Dharma talk. So last week's Dharma talk, I was using language a certain way, and I just want to clarify something. So last week's sutra was sort of about two kinds of pleasure two different kinds of pain and two different kinds of neutral feelings. And sort of like these different types of pleasure and one type of pleasure that increases unwholesome states like anger and things like that versus another kind of pleasure that decreases unwholesome states, okay? And what I did in that Dharma talk last week is I was using the language of dependent and independent. And I was talking about dependent pleasures and independent pleasures. And in that talk, for example, I was talking about pleasures that come from things, you know, sweets, sex, all kinds of things where the pleasure is coming this way. And this, so the pleasure is dependent. And then I was talking in contrast to pleasure coming from independence of things. And in that Dharma talk, using the language of dependent and independent, or we could even say conditional, unconditional, I was using that language very loosely, super loosely. And what I mean is in the world of pleasure, that's the kind of good kind of pleasure, what we're talking about or what we were talking about last week is a kind of like a, a jhana, for example, one of the jhanas. And the idea is, is that to be in a jhana is pleasurable. But it's a type of pleasure that increases wholesome states and decreases unwholesome states. Where I misspoke last week, though, was that pleasure, though, is dependent. It's dependent on being in a jhana. 
So my language last week was a little incorrect when I kept talking about dependent and independent. What I was talking about in, in, in Michaelese, right, in my own language, was, you know, pleasures that move towards dependency versus pleasures that move towards the unconditioned, that move towards independence in that way with the ultimate goal of being unconditioned, independent. So the idea was, is that those pleasures like jhanas, they get you closer to the independent, but they are still dependent. And that's where I misspoke last week. So I just wanted to put that as a little errata in that way and a little correction. So, and thank you for always commenting on the YouTube videos, by the way, they're they always help me as a teacher. So this is coming from a comment. So if you are out there, thank you. Otherwise, that's going to do it for tonight's Dharma Doors. This was a tiny little sutta, just three little pages. Uh, but next week's is a little more in depth. So we will be back with Vachagutta with uh, more. Maria? <clears throat> I'm so glad you mentioned that because at some point during last week, that thought went through my head. I was like, wait, but that's dependent upon being in that. Yeah. Yep. So, um, but mm -hmm. I was also going to share that through Dharma Doors and tonight, when you answered my question, it reminded me that how I had, I had these questions like prior to Dharma study, um, that have been answered. And one of them was um, like, what makes things be things, right? So like, you know, I studied a little bit of physics and I understand what makes like atoms stay together, but like what makes things stay things? And at some point along this journey with you, um, it became clear that mind makes things um so thank yeah. you for that um and right. it, it didn't hit me you know until fairly recently and i was like oh i know what makes things <laughs> <laughs> thank you awesome yeah welcome to mind only buddhism yeah yes wonderful thanks for and thank you for that reiteration of that of that because that's a said it clearly. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Awesome. All right, everybody. Then that'll do it for tonight. Like I said, I'll be back next week with, uh, I guess, Sutta number 72. So stay tuned for that.